and welcome to Warwick iCast. This week, how a new research programme is looking into how useful technology is to help carers looking after people with dementia. But first, a new arrival is enabling engineers to scan component parts, or even a whole car, down to the nearest micron. To demonstrate the process, Dr Mark Williams has borrowed a priceless 1928 Lee Francis hypercar. This technology came about, the need for non-contact measurement systems for creating digital representations of physical objects. We started off with the more traditional touch probing technology. This emerging non-contact laser scanning has really uh, provided a huge opportunity to move into new markets such as the medical industry, the heritage sector, and uh, look, looking at uh, creating digital representations of uh, of really rare, rare pieces of um, heritage. This all started when I visited the Coventry and Transport Museum about a month ago. I was walking around looking at all their fantastic exhibits they've got there and it really got me thinking about what happened to the Sarkin Museum where all those rare exhibits were damaged and they had no way of replacing them. We've been interested in this sort of idea for the museum for quite some time and um, it was actually just a cold call from Mark, Mark Williams. He got in touch saying, we've got this fantastic technology, would you be interested in getting involved? So we said, yeah, very much like to. The car we chose to bring along today is a 1928 Lee Francis Hyper. It was the car that won the Ulster TT in 1928, driven by quite a famous racing driver at the time, Kay Don. And it's a very, very unique car. It's very well known in the racing circuit. At the museum, we get quite a lot of people come to us and say, can we borrow a part? Can we have a a, a piston from a certain car uh, or a, a, a component from that car? Because there's no drawings left. So the only way that they can actually get a casting made or something like that is to have that part, take it away, create a mould and have the casting. Well, obviously, if we can scan these, you know, those castings, we can then actually CAD them up and then they can be made from those CAD designs from the computer on CMC machines. So there is an aspect there that we might be able to help enthusiasts in the future by producing these parts for them. Laser head will project a laser line through a mirror and that will scan over the surface of the car. And from that laser line, there'll be a reflection, and that can judge the distance and the profile of the the car. And as you can see here, the profile will come across. This particular laser will generate almost 20,000 points per second. It can be quite a lengthy process. What you're seeing here today is the actual scanning part, where it generates point cloud measurement. For a small part, it can take five minutes. For a whole vehicle, it can take a couple of days to get all the information that you want. From that point cloud data, you need to be able to generate a surface. So you have to interpolate between the point clouds to generate a surface. And from that, it needs to be smoothed out to remove all the dents and surface inconsistencies. And then from that, you'll be able to generate a model and you'll be able to render it, be able to apply material characteristics so you can get a photorealistic model from the end of it. It will take anything to a week to create an exact replica of this car because obviously it's very complex, there are different materials. Um, this is a laser at the end of the day, and any, you know, measuring reflective surfaces and absorbent surfaces creates an additional problem in itself. So we feel in a, in a week we'll have an accurate 3D representation permanently, which we can then manipulate in the computer to either recreate components or, or parts if it's damaged, or even for access within the uh, film industry. We can actually create models, you know, digital representations of these models, so we can even crash them, in, crash them in the computer and not damage the real components. So there's all sorts of applications we can use once we have that library of electronic data that represents that part, we, we can do what we like with it. Very exciting opportunity. One of the things that we hope to get out of this project is to actually reproduce these mascots. In the museum, it's very difficult to leave them on top of the radiators where they sit because, unfortunately, they do get stolen or they might get damaged. Very useful to have a copy of this sort of thing because we can put them on top of the cars so that in future, if they get damaged or if they get stolen, it's not the original that's getting stolen, it's just a copy like this. And, of course, we may even be able to sell them in the shop, so there's a sort of commercial element to it as well. Caring for a loved one with dementia can be very demanding, but increasingly carers are using new technology to make their lives a little bit easier. Warwick Medical School's Dr John Powell has been looking into how appropriate text messaging and internet chat rooms can be in improving patient care and support their carers. This research was funded by the Department of Health, uh, the Policy Research Programme, and they were looking to fund projects which were interested in the use of information and communication technology in healthcare. 
We know that carers bear an enormous burden on behalf of society and uh, carers of people with dementia in particular um, pay a, a large price in terms of the social and psychological effects. And we're really looking at how in the future information and communication technologies can be used to support carers and to um, help those people who are looking after people with dementia. The technology available ranges from simple assistive devices which may alert you when someone has left water running or left the gas on without lighting it or um, has left a door open that shouldn't be left open um, through to smart homes where um, all these devices are networked up in some way so that you can tell um, whether for instance someone has has um, acted their normal behavior so that you know they've got out of bed at the right time and they've been to the bathroom and they've used the kettle and they've opened the fridge and you can sort of monitor people's behavior in a in an automatic way with computers um, and then there's also the internet-based technologies that carers are using, for instance, to interact with other carers in virtual communities um, or, or to interact with health services through email consultations or other forms of, of um, remote health care. I've met some of you before. My name's Lee Gunn. I am assisting John and primarily I'm doing the interviews, so I'm going out to see carers and getting them to talk about their experiences as well as their views about new technology. It is very early days. Um, there are certain things that I know I'd like to look more clearly at. One of them is uh, social networks um, and how the internet can make a difference to social networks. Um, the second thing is the diversity of and strength of views about remote monitoring technology such as uh, cameras and satellite navigation technology uh, assistance. Another thing that I'm finding very interesting is the fact that a huge range of people know a great deal about new technology, even people who think they don't, uh, even people who don't use new technology themselves. Most people are, know about it and are in touch with it. How do you feel about the use of technology to care for somebody? I think that anything that we can do to assist carers is to an advantage, definite advantage yeah, in any way, shape or form, certainly new technology. I haven't touched anything like this since I was 18 and I'm 80 now, so it's a long time ago. With technology, it's way above me. I'm 94. What has struck you most about people's views on cameras and satellite navigation systems? What I found most interesting is how extreme views can be. Some people say a camera would be enormously helpful to me in caring, in helping the person I care for. Uh, others say there's absolutely no way that we would dream of using such intrusive technology. What do you think about using cameras, for example, to keep tabs on where the patient is? Well, I think it's a good idea. I do because you've always got something there to fall back on. My husband used to go walkabouts. How he used to get out, I don't know, sometimes, in his pyjamas, and we had the police out. Now, it's something that I could have monitored, it would have been incredible. What we need to understand is, as these technologies are developed, what is the best way of implementing them? How do we get people to actually use these if they are uh, positive? Um, and... Uh, and also to understand when in some cases such technologies have a, have a less positive effect. Because for some people, um, being able to monitor someone remotely, for instance, using um, uh, like CCTV in your own home and, and to be able to monitor them from, from your workplace would be very beneficial for that person. It may you know, allow them some independence as a carer. Um, but equally, for other people, that would seem far too intrusive and it would be a, a type of surveillance society. And what we need to find out is... is um, not only uh, how do we implement the good technologies, but also how do we avoid the, the pitfalls of technology. That's all from Warwick iCast for this week. Until next time, goodbye.